Hello, I'm John Seabrook. This is Will's laptop. He told me not to push any buttons. But what's this one do? No. Um, at any rate, I'm going to uh, introduce Will, and then you're in for a treat. Will's going to uh, uh, play a short demo of his new game, Spore. And then I'll come back, and we're going to have um, a little discussion. But first, I wanted to explain very briefly and very quickly why what you are about to see is so exciting and so interesting to so many people, and why you, too, should be aware of this new game, even if you, like me, fall on the wrong side of the great generational divide of our time, which is the divide between gamers and non-gamers. Will is a maker of simulation games. His games have no clear goals, no simple outcomes, few rules, no antagonists, hardly any violence, and no obvious way to win. Doesn't sound like much fun. And yet Will is, on top of being the greatest visionary in game design today, also one of the most successful game makers at work. Will's games seek to reproduce real-life dynamic processes. In SimCity, Will's first blockbuster, which first appeared in 1989, the player is in charge of managing hundreds of variables in a fictional city. He or she, for unlike most game designers, Will's games appeal to women equally as, as well as men, um, must manage the city's finances, choose wisely to invest in roads, hospitals, schools, in such a way that allows the city to grow. The game has not only been immensely successful commercially, it has probably influenced more young people to become urban designers than any other single work. For his next blockbuster game, The Sims, Will decided to simulate the dynamics of a family. In The Sims, the player is in charge of getting his Sims good educations, jobs, building their houses, finding the mates, friends, and all the many other things that go into leading a happy and fulfilling life. In short, the Sims is a simulation of ordinary, everyday life, which is a far more difficult thing to pull off than making a game about killing zombies or aliens. The Sims, which appeared in 2000, is now the best-selling PC game in history, and its various updates continue to sell well every year. At this point, most designers would have been content to rest on their laurels. But instead, Will challenged himself to come up with a far more ambitious simulation than the impossibly ambitious Sims, namely an algorithmic reproduction of Darwinian evolution. In Spore, you begin as a single-celled organism in a tide pool-like environment. With each new generation, you accumulate DNA points, which you can spend on one, or another, on one or another part of your being. You can choose to develop a bigger brain, faster limbs, or more powerful claws. You can play a conciliatory game of making peace with your neighbors, or you can play a warlike game of conquest. If you make the right choices, according to the logic of the simulation, you will continue to evolve. Eventually, you form tribes, acquire technology, build cities, and acquire the means to travel to other planets in the universe of the game, which will be populated by creatures other players have created and continue to evolve with them. In short, the game is endless. Spore is Sim Everything, which is in fact an, was an early title of the game. Breathtaking both in the simplicity of the concept and in the complexity of the execution, Spore is a simulation of the rules of life itself, and it is, easily, it is easy to imagine the community of Spore developing into an entire parallel universe, a new world. But while we're not sure who in this world wrote the rules, in Spore, we do know who the god of the universe is, and we're very lucky to have that god here with us today. So please welcome Will Wright. Hello, everyone. Uh, as John kind of alluded to, you know, games in some sense are like the black sheep of kind of the mass media landscape out there. And I think there are a couple reasons for that. Number one is generational. You know, there's definitely this kind of generational divide between people who grew up with games and continue to play them and the people that don't. And I think like with The New Yorker, there's probably not a huge overlap with the readership of The New Yorker and the people that play games right now, although it is significant, I think. But I think in about five years, it is going to be a significant overlap, I mean, a huge overlap. You know, surprisingly, our average player right now is 25 years old and about half female, which is a big change from about five or ten years ago. But uh, I think that's something that's going to change with time, basically. The other issue is it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Games really aren't very relevant to our everyday lives or about reality. 
And I think until games can be meaningful to people in kind of deep personal ways, they're never going to have like the emotional impact that things like a good movie or a good book have with us right now. So these are things that I'm kind of trying to address inside this kind of art form. And I'm going to give you just a little glimpse into the game I'm working on now that John talked about, Spore. There are a few things I really kind of wanted to do here. Number one was to give people a really big view of the world that they kind of come from. You know, take five steps back all the way to where you can see the complete history of life and possibly the future of life. You know, because to me, life in the universe is just an amazing property. You know, the universe is interesting, complex, stars are interesting, but nothing in the universe that we know of is anywhere near as interesting as life itself and where it might go. So in this game, you basically start kind of at the very beginning. We actually pick a little spot in the galaxy here, and then we actually dive in, and kind of the uh, initial story here is that this is panspermia, life coming to a planet inside of a comet, seeding basically a abiotic world. And the player is going to basically drive the evolution of life from the very earliest single cell phase all the way through to technology and then civilization. Now, another thing about games that's very interesting to me in terms of a form of media is that they're inherently malleable, which means that when people go see a movie or read a book, they're reading the same book or seeing the same movie, but games have the ability to change. They're unique and centered on every single individual. And right now, that takes the form of everybody's basically kind of driving in a different direction within the landscape of the game. But uh, it has much more possibilities than that, actually, where games can go. So here we're actually just kind of starting the game at a very, very small scale, microscopic organism. This is my little guy, and basically I have to kind of swim around and eat. Uh, as I eat, uh, my little guy grows. The camera actually begins to pull out. Uh, this game actually starts very, very simply and introduces concepts kind of slowly to the player. At some point, as I zoom out, these things that you see in the background will grow larger, and I'll be competing with them right now, I'm competing with these other small things. But uh, after I eat enough things in this, I'll actually lay an egg and then design the next version of my cell. So the thing that I'm driving around controlling here is actually of my own design. So in some sense, I'm an intelligent designer here. So here we see the camera pulling back a bit here. Now I'm going to skip ahead quite a bit here and show you what it looks like when I kind of enter the next phase of the game. And at some point, we become a large macroscopic creature, and we're designing that as well. Now, when I said that games are inherently malleable, one of the really interesting parts to me is that players can be creative in games. You don't really think of creativity so much when you're consuming other forms of media. But basically, we've built editors for everything in the game that you encounter. So here, we basically have kind of a metaphor of like this little clay-like thing that I can kind of inflate, deflate, uh, and basically kind of sculpt any creature I want to. This is the creature editor. So every level of the game, in some sense, you're editing some part of what you're going to be actually playing with in the game. So here, I'll put a mouth on it. And there's a little currency that goes along with this. These parts have like little morph handles. So what we wanted the players to do is actually create all the assets that they come across in the game. Typically what happens is a uh, computer graphics person, and it starts coming to life as I start building it. And pretty much anything I can envision, I can kind of build in this game here. Typically, you know, what would happen is a professional would spend many weeks kind of designing something like this, doing the mesh and, you know, high-end computer program. But we've basically taken what are normally high-end uh, development tools and made them very, very accessible and very easy to use, where like a six-year-old can kind of use these things. And so you see, as I start putting parts on this thing, it kind of slowly starts coming to life. And this will be the character that I play with. So here I have a full mesh, about 20 mouse clicks. This is something that typically would have taken a computer artist maybe a week to build. Uh, now, the computer at this point actually has some understanding of the topology of this thing. It knows where the back is, the side, the limbs. I can pick out texture scripts. And these are actually computer programs that analyze the thing and paint it instantly with a click of a button. And we can see it coming to life as well. And then once I basically have something that I like, I can go into test mode and then see how it would move. At this point, the computer is actually analyzing the thing I've created and then calculating kind of physics, how the thing would move, how it would behave. I can kind of run different animations, see it show different emotional states. So here it's kind of mad. <laughs> this is happy. <laughs> Laughing. <laughs> or dance. But now, what's kind of interesting about this is that we found that when somebody's able to create their own thing in the computer, the emotional attachment with it is tremendous. And what I really wanted to do was take kind of your average 10-year-old, which means an adult can use it also, and give them the power to create something that typically would take a Pixar artist, you know, weeks to create. 
And this is all done through the intelligence of the tools. You know, and really, I think this is a long-term trend in computers, is the fact that computers are going to enable people to do more and more creative things with less and less effort. And therefore, they have much more ownership over this thing. And so really, this is an aspect of storytelling. Because what people do in these games is they will take this creature out, and they'll actually drive it around in the game and have to you know, eat, survive, eventually mate to get back into this editor and design the next generation of this thing. And in doing so, they're basically creating a story. And typically what games have done up to now is they've kind of put you in the role of a protagonist. Here's who you are. Here's the backstory. Here's how you save the princess. And so basically you're Luke Skywalker or Frodo Baggins. But in something like this, what I really want to do is put the player more in the role of J.R. Tolkien or uh, George Lucas, where in some sense as they play the game, they end up creating every aspect of the game, of the creatures, of the characters, of the environments. Uh, I'm going to pop out of this real quickly and show you one of the last phases of the game here which is uh, there's a whole lot of the game that I'm just kind of skipping over right now. But basically what happens is you actually evolve your creature through many, many generations. You get to buy more parts, add it to it. You might become a carnivore. You might become a peaceful herbivore, social pack animal, whatever. Eventually you actually kind of go through. These are some of the other creatures that were designed by other players, as a matter of fact. Now as you're playing this game, let's say you're a creature living in this little environment competing with other creatures. The other creatures that you're competing with are actually coming from other players automatically. So as you play the game, the game is actually building a model of the player. And it's populating your world with things that it thinks are appropriate for your world, but they were made by other players. So the process of playing the game, you're making a lot of stuff, a lot of content. But it's also stuff that's being automatically downloaded to other players' games. So every time you play the game, you're encountering the creativity of other players as well. So it's a shared universe that players are building as they play the game. Now, this is much later in the game. Eventually, you kind of go through you know, tribe, civilization, all the way out into space. And so this is one of the later phases of the game where now we have high technology. We actually have this little UFO thing. Up to now, we've been playing the entire game on the surface of this one planet. This is where we've evolved. This is basically our home planet here. And in some sense, this is like a little toy planet that we've given the player. And so there's actually things like a very simple little food web here. Uh, there's a simple climate. We can actually kind of leave this world. We can uh, bring things with us, biological samples, and go out and start exploring other worlds here. So as I pull away here, this is our uh, home solar system. We see some comets, some other planets. Let me do a little cheat here really quick. So in some sense, I think of these things as toys. I went to a Montessori school, and I was always very impressed with Maria Montessori's kind of approach to education, which is that if you can kind of build the right toy and let somebody directly experience interacting with it, that they will discover really interesting principles on their own. And so in some sense, I kind of wanted this to feel almost like the ultimate philosophy toy, that in playing with this toy, you know, this toy universe, toy planets, toy creatures, that players would automatically kind of come to realize and trip over interesting principles of life and nature and science, things like the Copernican principle or the Anthropic principle, uh, Drake's equation. And these are things that just kind of are naturally a result of the situations that come up while playing the game. So here's a little planet that I've come to. This is maybe something some other players created. Uh, probably populated with other creatures, and I can do things like abduct the creatures and then bring them and try to actually bootstrap whole little ecosystems. So I'll just grab some here. In some sense, I can kind of use my UFO as a butterfly net collecting things with my abduction array. I can use these to actually populate an entire kind of food web on another planet, you know, and uh, or maybe even kickstart a civilization. I might come across a tribal planet and try to get them to worship me. Basically, all the genres of science fiction <laughs> that I enjoyed as a kid, you can kind of replay in this. We have a monolith I can drop in, kind of spark intelligence and make a race and, you know, become sentient. Uh, I can play War of the Worlds. I can become, uh, basically build a federation. I can also just kind of play with the toy planet and understand kind of long-term principles. One of the things about these toys that are interesting to me is the fact that I think a lot of the things that uh, we're screwing up the planet with now are a result of the fact that we don't have long-term intuition you know, we basically have short-term intuition over the space of a few years or maybe a few human lifespan, but we have very badly calibrated instincts over millennia and centuries. And so with something like a game, we can actually fast-forward all these processes. One of the things I can do here is I can actually kind of start playing with the planet uh, climate. So here I'm going to start injecting some greenhouse gases, and uh, over time we'll actually start seeing things like extinctions and uh, ocean levels rising. I could actually melt the planet if I wanted to. You know, in fact, one of the things I'm trying to do in the game is actually terraform planet and stabilize the biosphere. But basically the idea that I can give somebody, some kid or an adult, a toy planet, have them kind of experiment with it by kind of playing with it like a guinea pig, you know, poking and prodding it and seeing what the long-term results of it are, 
means that you can start, at least in some sense, calibrating long-term instincts for these things. And in some sense, you know, I want to give like every 15-year-old kind of the ability to be a god in this little limited kind of toy world and then get a sense of what kind of god, you know, would they be? Would they be a vengeful god, a nurturing god? And uh, just get a sense of the really big picture of life as you stand back. And as we pull back from this, you know, basically we're dealing with a world here that's being built collectively by the efforts of all these players. So this is our little home system with a few planets in it. As we pull back kind of to the interstellar level, we actually get kind of the local star system around our home star. And we're actually seeing things like Hubble objects, planetary nebula, black holes, other stars. Each one of these other stars has other planets. There are literally millions of different planets that are actually created by the other players. But this is actually a very, very small fraction of the entire galaxy, which is the world which is being built collectively by the millions of players playing the world. So it's basically an unlimited number of worlds that are built by the players as they play the game. So I'm going to stop the demo here and invite John back up to uh, interrogate me. Thanks. That was great. That was great, Will. Um, one of the things that immediately leaps out at me is having watched the Dennis Murin presentation last night, I feel like I'm looking at the absolute mirror image of what he talked about. I, for those of you that saw it, he took us through, actually you mentioned War of the Worlds, he took us through all the artistry and the wizardry that went into one shot of, of War of the Worlds, and all you have to do is sit back and eat your popcorn and watch. What you're saying essentially is players want to be Dennis Murin and do all that stuff themselves, and that's what's really compelling about the entertainment experience. So what I'm wondering is, can these two kinds of entertainment experiences sort of peacefully coexist, or as, as we go forward toward 2012, and people are more and more able to do sort of Dennis Mirren type stuff, is that going to become more compelling and the old form of watching movies less compelling? Well, I think what's happening right now is, you know, kind of the old media model is that there's this big wall between the kind of consumer and the producer of content. You have the, you know, the movie studios over here making big budget movies. They throw them over the wall, and then the fans go sit and watch, you know, the movie right. popcorn. Uh, what we're seeing now with media, not just computer games, but I think computer games are kind of leading the way, is that we're actually breaking down that wall and building a ramp now between, you know, so people can do a little thing on their home video, put it on YouTube, actually have a few people watch it. It's amazing just having a few people watch what you've done, watch what you've made, and give you a little bit of feedback, how motivating that is for certain people, and they'll start climbing that ramp, you know, at which point you'll start dealing with limitations of talent or resources. But the fact that the ramp exists is kind of tremendously important. You know, and something like that, you know, in some sense does exist in a world like sports. Anybody can kind of go out and play a pickup game of basketball. doesn't mean they're going to be a pro basketball player. But basically, there, there is a very staged kind of development. You know, I can take it as far as I want to. Right. And I think media is just getting to that point where also the tools are enabling people to be far more creative than they thought they could have been. And I hear this from, you know, people that play games all the time. In The Sims, we have this facility, as we're going to have in Spore, where players can actually capture a video of what they've done and use it as a very simple, like, movie development tool. Right. And these are people that if you would ask them, are they creative, they would have said no. But they start playing with these games and get, you know, a high facility at understanding how to operate it and move the camera and all this stuff. And in some sense for them, it's almost like learning a musical instrument. Right. You know, and they want to kind of show that skill in playing that instrument right. and actually perform it for other people. Right. That's interesting. Another thing that strikes me is uh, Dennis also talked about the, the amount of energy he puts into making things look real. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's part of the whole sort of experience of watching the movie. You have to believe that's real. It's striking aspect of Spore is that it doesn't look, you know, photorealistic. It looks a bit cartoony. Yeah. And, and I'm interested in your decision-making process there. Why, why did you choose to make it look that way? And is, is, do you see there's another form of realism at work here, which isn't a, a visual sort of realism, but a realism, a realism of system dynamics beneath that visual aspect? Well, there are a couple answers to that. You know, number one is that uh, the computer games industry has been driven by graphics realism. It was an arms race, basically. And every year it was like the games look better and better and better. But there wasn't enough thought in terms of how real the world was and the dynamics and the physics and all that. What actually is remarkable to me is looking back at the games that I played in my youth, like in the 80s, you know, these little pixelated characters that were like 20 white pixels, how real they seemed to me even though the graphics sucked, you know, the fact that the real character wasn't living on the screen, it was living in my imagination. Right. And that it took such a, you know, a simple representation was enough to spark a real kind of emotional response to my imagination when that little character blew up was remarkable to me. And I think that's really kind of where the real game resides is in the player's imagination. But uh, also, if you look at the history of art, you know, basically you had painters trying to achieve higher and higher levels of realism <clears throat> in painting, which they roughly did about 400 years ago. They achieved photorealism. Right. 
And from that point, Art decided, okay, well, instead of going for the external representation of objects, let's go more for the internal representation of how these objects make us feel. And we got things like, you know, modernism, impressionism, you know, constructivism, mm -hmm. things like that. So I think games are kind of getting to the point where we can almost put things on the screen that are plenty real enough, you know, to be realistic. And now we're starting to go into realms of artistic expression, you know, a little bit less real stylized. But if we had the capacity to make truly realistic characters in Spore, mm -hmm. do you think that would be more compelling? I mean, it, I mean, part of this is because the computer power isn't there for completely realistic looking yeah. characters, right? If you had it, would you want to make those kind of characters? Do you think you'd stay with... I would not for a game like this, because a game like this, I really want the players to own the characters. Mm -hmm. And I think by going to a certain level of abstraction, you're basically letting the player fill in the blanks in their imagination to some degree. It also makes the tools a little bit easier to use. If you were down to like seeing, you know, the stubble on their face, um, it's incredibly distracting as an author in terms of what you're building. Right. And all of a sudden, the level of editing just becomes tremendously more burdensome. So, in some sense, I think they're, you know, and also if you look at this kind of character design across, you know, fiction, you know, you kind of have the gamut from things like, you know, Geiger and Aliens all the way to Pixar, which is kind of cute and cartoony, oversaturated colors, and I think, in fact, what we really want is to give the players that palette. You know, not that everything you have to make is realistic, but in fact, they could make Pokemon mm -hmm. or things like that, you know, or Disney. Mm -hmm. um, I read an article in Esquire last summer. I think it was written by Chuck Klosterman. He was talking about, um, he said there's never actually been a, um, a, a, a work of criticism written about a video game that, that stands up based on its artistic principles, that, that all video games or computer games are to this day still basically reviewed like a, uh, new flat screen televisions, yeah. you know, it's sort of a, a little bit, of, you know, better here, better here. And I'm wondering, you know, is, do you, how do you feel about that? Do you feel that we, there is yet a sort of a body of critical standards that allows us to, to, to artistically discriminate between video games or that we're not there yet and it's going to take a while to get there? Well, I think as designers, we don't have a uh, developed language for talking about the craft of our art form which, you know, puts a double burden on a journalist trying to cover it or a critic. Right. Uh, at the same time, this is inherently an art form that you have to kind of look at from the inside out rather than the outside in. You know, when everybody's going to see the same version of Star Wars, it's pretty easy for the critic to kind of understand that they're having the same experience sitting in the theater that every other patron is. Whereas in a game, every player is going to drive it into a totally unique space and have a totally different experience. Basically, in some sense, play their own story. Right. So it's much harder. I think you kind to of... define a set of standards for that kind of experience. Yeah, it's yeah. It's so individualistic. Right. At the same time, you know, it's a dramatic narrative, you know, that's unique to every player. Right. So it has aspects of architecture, product design, depends on the time of day you were playing, who you were playing with. Was it a social game you were playing with friends? Right. Uh, were you being very creative and making cool things in it? Uh, so it's going to be quite a while, I think, before we have, you know, kind of that language for talking about the medium. Uh, the same problem is actually what schools are facing because a lot of students are wanting to come in learning how to design computer games. And uh, there isn't a critical amount of teachers out there that have the experience or the language for them to speak to the students yeah. about this as a design form. Yeah, it occurs to me listening to you uh, talk about the game just now that, you know, you, uh, I've, we writers have to worry about writing a good book or writing a good article, but we don't have to worry about going out and explaining to people why articles and books can be good you know, are oh, worthwhile yeah. to read. Whereas it seems like part of your job, on top of everything else you have to do as a designer, is that you sort of necessarily also have to be an evangelist for this art form. And I was wondering, does that frustrate you? Would you rather just have done with that and just concentrate on, on your work? No, I think that's a property of the art form being in a very kind of early, undeveloped state, which, you know, is exactly why I find it interesting and remarkable, because there's this huge amount of unexplored space in the medium. Uh, but at the same time, you know, people tend to associate games with the reptilian brain. You know, they're about aggression, fear, anxiety. Uh, and I think games are slowly kind of evolving out toward the cerebral cortex. And so, but I think, you know, games certainly have the ability to kind of go there. One of the really interesting things about games to me long term is the fact that as you play a game, and this is something that we're doing very early on in Spore a little bit, is that uh, the player is in some sense building a model of what they play. They're playing with a toy city or a toy world, toy planet, and they're actually building a model in their head. Uh, a more elaborate model than they had before. So in some sense, that's the real model we're building is in the player's head, not in the computer. The computer's just a compiler for what the player's building. But at the same time, we're getting to the point where we can observe what the player does and have the computer build a model of the player and come to understand what you enjoy doing, what your skill level is, what your aesthetics are. And it can actually start modifying the game around each player individually. The game's playing you. Well, it's basically evolving to fit you. 
you know, yeah. it's inherently possible for games to start to evolve to fit each individual player, which makes them a wholly unique form of media. Yeah. And I think that's like an incredibly exciting kind of aspect of where this might yeah. go. Yeah, that's exciting. One of the great things about your work is that you use science to tell stories. It's, it's, Sim Earth, which is another one of his games, kind of uses Earth science to create stories. He talked, you talked about um, astronomy and principles of astronomy and mm -hmm. spore. I write about science quite a bit, and I often find there's at some level sort of a conflict between science and the principles of science and doing science and designing experiments and narrative and the need to create stories out of science because narrative is, is inherently kind of smoke and mirrors at a certain point. Yeah, narrative is inherently kind of subjective, whereas science, science wants to be inherently objective. Yeah. You know, science wants to be reproducible from any given viewpoint, any given scientist, whereas narrative is really told from a specific viewpoint and is very interpretive right. in its essence. So I think, you know, but at the same time, you talk to a lot of scientists and it turns out that they approach science, you know, really from deep intuition and they use experimental data to kind of support their intuition. But really, it's amazing how many of them are guided by things like faith and intuition. And in some sense, in their own head, they have kind of a narrative around where they're going with it. Mm. And then they have to support that with external data under real science. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I think we're out of time. And I should, I should add at the end, people might be wondering, when can I go and get a copy of Spore? This is sort of like the $20,000 question. But I, I've been told the end of the year. Around the end of the year. Yeah. Around the end of the year, maybe for Christmas, we can all have Spore. Yeah. Anyway, thanks to Thank Will Wright. Thank you very much. Thanks, Will. Thanks.